visiting Casper uh, Green Larsen, who is a professor at Aarhus University. We're very excited to have him. Um, and he's going to talk um, about some uh, TCS perspectives in machine learning. And his research um, so far has, or is broadly in TCS. Uh, he's mostly known for load bounds in the past and now recently has uh, gotten really into research on machine learning. Uh, and he also has received some of the most amazing awards in our field, the Best Broker Award 2019, Best Paper Award at Stock, and uh, Best Student Papers at Stock and Fox. Um, and we are very excited for this talk. Um, thanks a lot. Continue. Thank you very much. So let me just see if I can uh, share the slides. Uh, I guess they are here. Yeah, do you see them? Yes, it works. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks a lot for having me here. And as I'm presenting this this work here, uh, bagging is an optimal pack learner, which is, I guess, still in, in submission. So it's a kind of recent work uh, that I've done last year. And, and I'll try to explain what, what all of these things are. Right. So, so the general setup is that we're looking at a supervised learning here. So in particular, we're looking at binary classification problems. So just as an example, right, you, you get some kind of input training data, uh, which consists of features and labels, right? So it could be pictures, for instance, where the pixels are the, the features and the labels could be what's on this picture, for instance, either a cat or a croissant. And then the, the goal is to use this, this training data somehow to make predictions of new data where you only see the features, uh, but not the label. So in this example here, right, you get this new image and you have to predict whether this is a, a picture of a cat or a croissant, right? So, so that's the general setup in, in this binary classification. And if you want to be a little bit more formal about it, uh, we typically say that the data comes from some input domain X, which could be all these uh, 724 by 724 pixel images, for instance. And then the, the data has some labels from some output domain Y. And for binary classification, there's just two different labels, right? Either cats croissants, and typically we think of them as, as minus one and one, which is, I guess, convenient in many cases. And, and then there's this unknown target function, which is some mapping F from the input domain to the output domain. And we should think of this as, say, the correct mapping of images to cats or croissants, right? So this is basically what we're trying to learn. And in this simplest setup here, we assume this is just a deterministic function. Uh, and this is what we're trying to learn. Okay. So to learn this, this function, what we have available is this training data. And the training data just consists of labeled examples, right? So we see, say, M points consisting of an element from the input domain and the corresponding evaluation of this unknown target function on that uh, point or input element. And so this is the data that we have available. Uh, so can anyone say, can you actually see my mouse when I'm moving it around? You can see the so mouse as point well. stuff. You can see the mouse, great, so I can point with it. Right, good. So so this is what we have available for uh, to make, uh, to produce a hypothesis. So that's the goal here is to somehow output a new function H that is also a mapping from the input domain to the output domain. And then the whole is of the idea is that you want this output hypothesis to be as close as possible to this unknown target function, right? So that when we get new data, and we use this H, there's a good chance it'll uh, correctly predict the label of, of this element that we see. Okay. So, so basically, these are the ingredients in, in supervised learning here. Uh, we have this unknown target function here on the top left. So mapping from the input domain to the output domain, we see some training examples consisting of elements and the evaluation of the unknown target function. This is then fed into a learning algorithm. The learning algorithm somehow searches through a hypothesis set H to produce this final hypothesis that hopefully looks like the unknown target function. So, so again, in this example, right, F would be this correct mapping of images to cats and croissants. And the training data would be then examples of input elements and their labels. And then what learning algorithms typically do is that they, they tend to look for a hypothesis in the hypothesis set that correctly predicts as many of the labels on the training data as possible, right? And this is something we can 
or we can determine for any given hypothesis, we can always evaluate it on all the training samples. And here we know the labels, so we can check how good it is, right? So we're trying to find one that gets as many labels uh, correct as possible. Right, but of course, right, there's some unspecified pieces here, right? There's what is this hypothesis at H? And also, what do we really mean when we say that this hypothesis we compute looks a lot like the unknown target function, right? So, so let me try to say a little bit about some concrete examples of hypothesis sets and, and what we mean here. So I guess maybe the simplest possible hypothesis that you can think of is, is the set of linear models. So let's say we have binary classification. Again, the labels are minus one, one. And let's say the input domain is RD, which means that any input element is described by D real numbers, right? So, so this is, I guess, the simplest type of data we could, we could imagine. And then the uh, natural hypothesis set would be the set of all hyperplanes where on one side of the hyperplane you return plus one, and on the other side you return minus one. Right? So this is a, a simple example of, of uh, a hypothesis set. And now uh, to say a little bit more about what we mean by a hypothesis looking a lot like the unknown target function, we're going to consider this classic model of PAC learning by Valian from 1984 where PAC stands for probably approximately correct. And so, so the basic idea of this model is going to tell us what we mean by H looking like F. And it's also going to say, tell us that the new data that we need to make predictions on uh, will be kind of similar to the training data we have available. And of course, this is, I guess, a necessity if we want to be able to make predictions on new data. There has to be somehow, uh, the new data has to look like the training data somehow. And the idea here is that... Um, data, the, the, the training data that we have uh, comes from some unknown distribution D over the input domain. So there's this data distribution over the input domain. And then we assume that the training data we have available um, are basically IID samples where we get the, the XI is drawn from D and then we see XI and the corresponding label. And we assume this training data are independent samples from, from this distribution D. So this is just an assumption about how the, the data was, was collected. And now the new data that we need to make predictions on, what we assume is that this new data is also drawn from the same unknown distribution D. Okay. And, and then finally, the, the overall goal is to output a hypothesis H whose error under the distribution D is as small as possible. And what is the error? It's just the probability over drawing this next training point from the distribution D of mispredicting the label with this hypothesis that, that we output, right? So the hope is to find a good hypothesis with a small chance of mispredicting the label of, of a new point. Okay. So, um, so this basically augments, I guess, this, this supervised learning setup where there's this unknown input distribution. Ah! Oops, sorry, I have some kids coming. I'm, uh, <laughs> can you give me just one second? I have my sons just coming. Sorry about that. My son just came home <laughs> unexpectedly. Uh, anyways, okay, let me continue. Uh, um, go to where were we? All right, right, so, so the picture is augmented with this uh, unknown input distribution D, which generates uh, training data. So it gives us these M training samples, X1 to XM. We see the corresponding labels. And then this final output hypothesis is also evaluated on an X drawn from this distribution D. And what we're really interested in is that this error under the distribution D is as close to zero as, as possible. Okay. So, so when we're starting packed learning, uh, there are actually several different setups that people will care about. And the simplest one is the so-called realizable setting or setup. So here, uh, we make an additional assumption, and this assumption is that the unknown target function that we're trying to learn uh, is actually in this hypothesis set that the algorithm has available. So, for instance, let's say that uh, H, again, is the set of all these linear models. Uh, so then the unknown target function is itself a, a hyperplane where everything on the one side is, is the plus one class and everything on the other side is the minus one class. Right, so what we're assuming is that there's actually... There exists a hyperplane that gives the correct labels for all elements in the input domain. And what does this mean, right? It means that, well, whenever we get a training data set, right, we get some points, uh, we can always find a hypothesis in the hypothesis set 
that correctly classifies all the training data, right? Because in particular, the unknown target function is in the hypothesis set. So, so we can definitely find one. Maybe it's not computationally efficient, but there definitely is a hypothesis in the hypothesis set that gets all the labels correct, right? Uh, so the picture, the, the thing is that we might not find the exact F, like if you can see here on the, on the picture, right? The hypothesis that we find is just promised to get all the training data correctly. And it might be a little bit different from the unknown target function. So it may still make, make mistakes if we get new points in the future that kind of lie in between the two types of predictions that they, they make. Right. And, and typically what algorithms do is so-called empirical risk minimization, right? So an algorithm just looks for a hypothesis that gets all the training labels correctly. Okay, so so it looks something like this, right? So uh, if we if we in the future see a point that lies between these two hyperplanes, that's when we'll we'll make a mistake in the prediction. Okay, and so there are also classic results on how good uh, can we expect this hypothesis H to be, and this is like a really classic result from the eighties, saying that uh, if I have some, no matter what the data distribution is, if I have enough samples, right? So let's for now there's just some formula here. If I have enough samples from this distribution, then with high probability, so with probability one minus delta, and this probability is over the training data set, right? So with high probability over the data I have available, it, it, the result says that any hypothesis that gets all the training labels correctly also has an error of at most epsilon for a new data point drawn from the distribution D. Right? So there's a, one, there's a delta parameter and epsilon parameter saying, right, I want the error to be at most epsilon, the ch chance of misprediction, and I want this to hold with high probability, with probability 1 minus delta over the training data set. And technically, right, you'll, you'll see that this 1 minus delta has to be there, right, but maybe you're unlucky and your training data set is just copies of the same training point, right? You, maybe you just get M copies of the same points, and so then you really cannot learn uh, much. So there's always a risk of being unlucky. So this is captured by the one minus delta, and then the epsilon is how accurate you want to be. And this classic result says that, well, you need samples, the number of samples you need to get error epsilon is proportional to one over epsilon times a d here, which is the so-called VC dimension of H, and I'll get back to what that is, and times the log or epsilon factor here. And then there's some term also depending on, on delta over here. Okay, so, so uh, and, and this is tight. There's basically been shown a lower bound saying that, well, as long as what you're doing is to look for something that gets all the labels correct, uh, then this is, this is the right number of samples that you need. Kasper, we have a question from the audience. It yes. Is, um, so the question is, this doesn't depend on the size of the hypothesis set. Uh, right. It depends, yeah, so it depends on this VC dimension of the hypothesis set, which is related to its size. So I'll maybe try to show what this VC dimension is on the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, this VC dimension captures the complexity of the hypothesis set, if you will. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's uh, look at what this VC dimension is, right? So this is this... Uh, uh, another question that we have yeah. is, is D here for linear? Uh, this, uh, this bound holds for all hypothesis sets as long as this, this D is the VC dimension, yeah. Uh, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be linear models. It can be anything. It can be decision trees. It can be neural nets. Uh, as long as uh, we know what the VC, as long as we have a bound in the VC dimension, uh, then uh, we get a, a bound here. Yeah. Uh, so let me say what this VC dimension is. If you haven't seen the, the definition before, uh, and it's interesting because the VC dimension actually allows for infinite hypotheses, and still you get an interesting bound, right? So the VC dimension of a hypothesis set is the D such that two things hold. Um, so there exists a set of D samples from the input domain that can be shattered and no set of D plus one samples from the input domain can be shattered. So, so what does this mean? So if I have D points, if I, and I want to shatter them, what does this mean? It means that, well, so it's binary classification, right? So there's two to the D different ways I could label these points, right? And I say that I shatter D samples if all two to the D labelings can be realized by some hypothesis in the hypothesis set. Right, so let's let's look at an example here. So let's say the input domain is R1, just for simplicity, right? So input elements just have a single coordinate. And let's say that H is all hyperplanes. And so I guess a hyperplane in 1D is basically just a point and everything on one side of, of that point, you call a plus one, and everything on the other side, you call, call a minus one. 
So, so let's see that we can actually shatter two points. And so if I want to shatter two points, I have to show that I can realize all four different labelings using a hypoplane. And I guess it's not too hard to convince oneself that this is the case here. I can actually shatter two points uh, like this. Now, on the other hand, if I wanted to shatter three points, then no matter what three points I look at on the line, if I want to color or label the outermost ones minus one and the innermost one one, there's no way to do this using a hyperplane, right? So it's not possible to shatter three points. So this means that the VC dimension of hyperplanes in, in a one is two. And in general, the VC dimension of hyperplanes in D dimensions is, is D plus one, right? So, so this gives a bound before on the sample complexity, if you will here, for instance, if I'm using linear models, I could put in the dimension here uh, in the sample complexity bound. And this is even though there are infinitely many hyperplanes I can choose from, I can still prove something here. Right? And, and it doesn't have to be linear models. It's this VC dimension uh, is defined for any hypothesis set. Can I maybe ask okay. whether you chose to like present the linear models because that is what you you will do the proof about, or is it a simplification so that we understand? Uh, the linear models was just to have an example, yeah, and be able to draw a picture where you have uh, F and H here. I, I see. So you're... Your algorithm or what you're presenting is also about, like in general, about VC dimensions. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, all the rest of it works for any hypothesis set with the VC dimension of D. We'll get a get bounds. Yeah. Yes. So this is just for example that we're looking at linear models. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So okay. So just this expression is a little bit long, and this one minus delta. So from here on, I'm just going to ignore the the delta, just to keep things simple. Uh, so, so this bound is a little bit simpler here, but just remember whenever I'm saying something like uh, the number of samples we need, there's always a log one over delta over epsilon term. And the whole statement always holds only the probability one minus delta, but it's just a little annoying and it's not the interesting term anyways. So I'm just going to ignore it. Okay. So I'm just going to hide delta from here on. And, but the interesting thing is, right? So there's actually a lower bound saying that this is the number of samples you need, like one over epsilon D log one over epsilon. Uh, but there's actually a way of, of getting around this lower bound. Uh, so, and, th and I think this is quite surprising, right? So, so we're promised in this realizable setup, right? We're promised that the thing we're trying to learn is actually in the hypothesis set, right? So we're promised that there is a hyperplane that, class that, that gives the true labels. But an algorithm, right, it, it doesn't necessarily have to return a hyperplane, right? Maybe it could return something else. And... It was actually a big open problem for 30 years or more, right? Whether it was possible to do better by not returning a, a hyperplane or, or something from the hypothesis set. And in 2016, Hennig has showed that uh, there's actually an algorithm that no matter what the data distribution is, it just needs D over epsilon samples to return a hypothesis. This is no longer a, a hypothesis from H, but to return some hypothesis whose errors at most epsilon. Right, so you actually manage to shave this uh, log one over epsilon factor by doing something that's not uh, the obvious thing, yet you're not looking for something in the hypothesis set. Uh, so I, I think this is quite surprising that you can do better. You promised that there's, a, say, a linear model that uh, correctly classifies all data, but you're returning something that's not a linear model. And, and moreover, you can actually prove that this bound here is optimal no matter what the learning algorithm is doing, right? it, it, uh, can do even if it can do anything. Okay, so I think I'll, because it's important for my result, I'll sketch uh, Hennig's optimal pack learner and what his algorithm is doing. Uh, it's, it's important to understand my own uh, contribution here. So the way his algorithm works is that uh, if you have your M training points, let's just put them, uh, sort them somehow, right, uh, just from X1 to XM. And then he has this uh, procedure for generating subsamples of the data. So what is it doing here? So let me try to animate what it's doing. So, um, so it has like a base case here. It, it looks at if the training data set size less than four, this is like a base case. This is not the case on this example here. So what we're doing now is we're going to partition our data into four pieces of equal size. Right? So we partition the data into, into these chunks. And then he does three recursive calls here. So let's try to look at the first recursive call for generating subsets of the training data. So what you're doing here is that you're saying, okay, my new S is going to be the first piece of the data. 
And then I'm going to take S2 and S3, and I'm going to put them into the second argument called T. Okay, so, so what I'm doing is I'm kind of saying, okay, this is my new uh, S, and then I have this T that I'm carrying around that was S2 and S3, and I'm kind of ignoring S1 here. Okay, so what's what's happening here then? Now I'm going to do another recursive call, right, because I'm not down at the base case yet, so I'm going to partition this S into four pieces of equal size. I'm going to do another recursive call here where I'm basically I'm taking the, this T here, the blue part, and then I'm adding S2 and S3 to it, and I'm leaving out S1. So now I'm, I get this recursive call, and finally now I'm down at a base case where I'm going to return now, I'm going to output a, a subset of the training data that, which consists of S here and T. So I'm going to output these pink samples here. So I'm going to, this is like a procedure for creating a subset of the training data. So I, I pick this subset and I output it. Now, this was, of course, just one uh, recursive path in this subsampling procedure. And if you look at all the recursive calls, you'll be generating all these different subsets. So what you can kind of see here is that uh, there's kind of like the, the top level of recursion corresponds to like one of each of these three chunks here where you kind of leave out one of the, the last three pieces and then you do the same recursively. So you generate all these different pink subsets of the data. Okay. So, so this is a, like a subsampling procedure that Haneke uses that leaves out one group per recursive level. Now, what is his algorithm then? So his optimal learning algorithm, it's kind of, I don't know if it's intuitive, but what it's doing is it's calling this subsample procedure to produce all these pink subsets of your data. And now what it does is it runs through each of these subsets and then it does, uh, I guess, empirical risk minimization, right? So you just look for a hypothesis, hypothesis that gets all the labels correctly on this training data set, like each of these subsamples. Okay, so this is like find if it's again if the if H happens to be linear models, you just look for some hyperplane that gets all the labels correct. And then at the end of the day, once you've trained on each of these subsamples, your final classifier is outputting the majority vote amongst all of them, right? So if the labels are minus one one, it just returns the sign of the sum of predictions, right? So you're just doing a majority vote at the end of the day among all these classifiers that you trained. So this is his algorithm that has been proved to be to be optimal. I don't know if it's an intuitive algorithm, but I'll try to at least give you the idea now in the analysis and try why uh, this algorithm does something useful. Okay. So so if you want to try and look at his analysis, and this is just kind of the high level ideas, the, the analysis is kind of intri intricate, but let's let's try to look at the main idea in the analysis. So if we try to look at the top level of recursion, you're generating a bunch of subsamples in this first recursive call, right? In particular, this is going to generate a third of all the subsamples, right? And uh, you're going to run, you're going to find a, a hypothesis uh, for each of those subsamples that are being generated. And the interesting thing here is that all these, all the hypotheses that we're training on these subsamples they all of them leave out this piece of the training data called this one here, right? So none of those hypotheses are trained on, on S1. Okay, so somehow we have a left out piece of the training data here that this entire one third of all hypotheses, they leave out S1. Now, if we look at one of these other recursive calls, the, the second recursive call here, the interesting thing is that all these uh, subsamples that are being generated here <clears throat> sorry, uh, they all include all of S1, right? They, they put this S1 into T, so they everything that's trained here will be trained on all of S1, and the same with the second recursive call, right? This second recursive call, everything here, uh, all these subsamples that are being generated includes all of S1. Okay, so, so why is this useful? So if we go back to, so say, the first recursive call here where we leave out S1, the first one-third, uh, so intuitively, like since we don't look at this data when we're training these hypotheses, then uh, we could try to look at this one third of all hypotheses, right? Just try to look at the, if we did a majority vote only among this one third, okay? So if I'm doing a majority vote amongst this one third, okay, I could look at what is the chance that this majority is wrong, that gets the wrong label. And intuitively, if there's a large chance that you make a mistake, 
then since S1 here is not used for training, all these samples are independent of this majority of, of all these hypotheses that you trained. So, so basically you're going to see a lot of mistakes in this training data, right? If, if the majority of the first one third of an error, you're going to see it in this left out piece of the data as one. Okay. So let's look, let's say that these lightning bolts here, they denote samples where the majority of the first one third, they err. Right. So, so you're going to see these examples. Now, if I tell you that these samples are the ones where you have a mistake, and if you think a little bit about it, you can still say that these samples here, their distribution now, they're still independent samples, not from the original data distribution, but from the data distribution where you condition on the majority of the first one third making a mistake and being wrong. Okay, so the, I hope this makes some sense that these examples are just independent samples from this new distribution where you're conditioned on making a mistake. Okay. So, so what can we use this for? So if we look at now the remaining two-thirds of all hypotheses, right? All these remaining two-thirds include all of this one in their training data. So in particular, it, they include these lightning bolts, these mistakes of the first one-third, right? Uh, and since we're in this realizable setting, right, all these hypotheses that we're computing in these two two thirds here, all these hypotheses will correctly classify all their training data. In particular, they will correctly classify all the lightning bolts. Okay. So, and these lightning bolts, right, they were really, uh, they were really samples from the distribution where we condition on the first one third making a mistake the majority being wrong. And so now what you technically do is that you use this old result by Vapnik, the normal uh, bounds that we have for the performance of something that get, if, if you just find a, a hypothesis that gets everything correct. So his old result is saying for any distribution D, if I have enough samples from this distribution, right, any hypothesis that gets all the labels correctly has a small error under this distribution. But what we're going to use is that we're going to, in place of this distribution, we're going to use this conditional distribution, right? The distribution that says the first one third make a mistake. So what we achieve now is to say, well, these two thirds of all hypotheses, the ones that include all of this one, basically they rarely make a mistake when the first one third make a mistake, right? So this is what this is giving us. So in some sense, what we're saying is when the majority of the first one third errs, the remaining two thirds are almost always correct, right? And since we are out, at the end of the day, we are putting a majority vote, vote amongst everyone. It's great to have two thirds that are correct and only one third that is wrong, right? Then the majority will be correct. So this is kind of the idea and the analysis that by leaving out some of the data, you're going to see examples from where you make a mistake. And then you train even more hypotheses on these mistakes so they're kind of trained to correct each other's mistakes. That's the basic idea in, in his analysis. Okay. So I hope it at least makes some sense at a high level uh, how this uh, argument goes. It's, it's really uh, subtle, but, but, but very uh, elegant proof uh, nonetheless. So basically what Hennigke does is then to show that, well, if you just plug in these classic bounds uh, and then do this analysis somehow using this whole recursive tree to... In, in, in some recursive argument, you can prove that this is enough to to get the optimal sample complexity of D over epsilon. Right? So, so this is not obvious, but but you you can you can make it work by by using this as the main observation. Okay, good. So this was all about previous work, right? So Henneke has this uh, beautiful result uh, that that gives an algorithm that has the optimal sample complexity for pack learning in this realizable, the simplest possible setup you can, you can consider. So I think it's a really, really nice result. Um, but of course you could ask yourself, right, has this had any practical impact? Um, and unfortunately not, not really, right? So it's not really an algorithm that's, that's being used in practice. And like maybe one reason for it is that you're actually generating quite a lot of soft samples. So it's kind of slow, at least if you have large data sets. It's a little bit complicated as, as well, right? Um, so, so if we just try to quickly look at what is the running time of this algorithm, really. Uh, so, so this is subsampling procedure, right? Um, that has three recursive calls. And each of these uh, recursive calls is on a 
subset, like this, the size of S goes down by a factor four. So the recursion depth is going to be log base four of M. And so the number of subsamples will be like three to the log base four of M, which is something like M to the 0 0.79. Okay. And each of these subsamples, right, has size at least half of all the training data. As you can see, right, already on the top level, you're keeping like half the data. So the running time, right, is if you're training for M to the 0 0.79 times, you're training on something of linear size, right? So it's like almost quadratic running time, at least uh, depending on the speed of, of the basic learning algorithm. Right? So it's kind of slow, at least if you have large data. Um, so, so the main question like, uh, I, I asked is, you know, so can we do it in a, is there a simpler way of achieving the same, right? So is there a simple algorithm, maybe even a practical one, uh, that's also an optimal pack learning algorithm, right? So Hennigus is the only, uh, was the only known optimal learning algorithm. So, so the main observation is that Hennigus algorithm is really doing a majority on subsamples of the training data, like these highly structured subsamples of the data. And this is really similar to, to bagging, uh, which is like an old technique from 1996. So let me just show you what bagging is. It's, it's also called bootstrap aggregation. Uh, it's a simple algorithm. So, so if you're doing bagging, uh, you're going to do the following t times. So you're going to sample some of your training data points, some m prime points uh, from your uh, data. Also, d here, uh, sorry, d here should have been uh, s, sorry. And this should be from your data set. So you sample points from your data set S. You just sample them uniformly with replacement. And then you call this set that you sampled SI. And then you train a hypothesis on SI. And finally, you output a majority vote. Right? So it's a super simple algorithm. It just says, well, repeat a couple of times. Uh, and why this should also be a T. I'm sorry for the typos. Right? So you just repeat a bunch of times. You sample a random subset of the data with replacement. And you just train on it, and you output a majority vote. So, so this is bagging in general. So just as a picture here, if you have this training data here, uh, you sample a random subset, right? You sample one of the points, you include another one, you include another one. Maybe you have repetitions. So you have a, you sample this data set. You do it a couple of times, sample different subsets of the data. And you train a hypothesis on each of them. So maybe you train a linear model on, on all of them. And finally, you take all these uh, models and output a majority vote. So you kind of overlay them. And, well, in this region, right, they all say that the uh, label is blue. In this region, there's still a blue majority. And there's only one red, two blue, and, and so forth. So you can see that you get this decision boundary here. And this is not like a, a linear model, right? So you just do the majority of these three three models. So this is this is bagging. And uh, so, so if you compare it to, to Hanekes, where he has this very structured way of creating subsamples, bagging, you just choose some random subsamples. Okay. So the main question, I guess I, I, we ask here is, is bagging also an optimal pack learner? It's definitely a simple, it's, it's a simple algorithm to describe. Uh, it's used all the time in practice. I guess this, this original paper on bagging has 30,000 citations or something like this, right? This only happens if it's practical. There's no theory paper with 30,000 citations. And uh, so it would be practical. It's, it is at least practical if you don't have to subsample too many times. Right? And also, uh, it's often used together with this extension called random forest, which is just a kind of a bagging with a few extra tricks on top of it, uh, where you decide on the hypothesis set being decision trees. Okay. So the main result of, of this work is that, yes, bagging is actually an optimal pack learner. And here's the full theorem statement. So what it says is for any distribution D, if you have one or epsilon times D plus log one over delta samples from this distribution D, and you run bagging with log M over delta subsamples, right? So you repeat the subsampling process M over delta times. Then with probability one minus delta, you're going to output a hypothesis whose errors at most epsilon. Right? So this is the optimal sample complexity from before, and the same as, as Hennigus. And I think the interesting point here is that the number of subsamples is much smaller, only a logarithmic number of subsamples. Right? So maybe just to make clear here, right? There's, now there's two random ingredients, right? Both the training data set and the subsampling that bagging is doing. Uh, so this probability one minus delta is over both the randomness of the input and uh, the bagging algorithm. Okay, so, so just to keep the slides simple, I'm just going to hide all these deltas from from here on. Right? So, so it's going to look like this.
Yeah. So when you're subsampling in the bagging algorithm, like how large is your sample normally? Is it roughly half the size or? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, the the proof works for any. I, I prove basically any down to any constant factor, and I proved it up to like one. Like you you repeat m times basically because. It's with replacement, so you don't get all the training data. You still get only a constant fraction of the data. I think the important point is that somehow you get like a constant fraction of the data. Uh, it has to be a constant fraction smaller than the full set and, and also at least a constant fraction of the full data set. That's the kind of the main idea. So, so subsample anything from, and I think in practice, people go from between half and, and even up to the full size of the original data set. Yeah. But the theorem, yeah, the theorem statement is for any constant between one and uh, and zero point zero two or whatever I chose to to prove. Yeah, so the the constant goes into another constant somewhere depending on on the trade off. Yeah. Okay, so this is like hiding delta is is pretty clean, right? We get this do epsilon samples, and you just need to run log m times where you have to to subsample to to get the optimal error. So so basically, if we compare them, right, it, it looks like this, right? In any case, you need m to the 0 0.79 very structured uh, subsamples, and over here you only need log m random subsamples. Okay. Uh, and I think really an interesting point here is that this algorithm bagging was known for 20 years before Hennig's algorithm was known. Uh, and then I, I think it's like a classic algorithm that's taught in all undergraduate machine learning courses. And I guess right also this this fact that like the pa paper has 30,000 citations, so people are using it all the time. Okay, so I think for the rest of the talk, I don't know if I'm, yeah, I guess I have still some time. Um, I'm just going to try to give just a sketch of the main idea of the proof and just to see if I can convince you how the argument goes. Okay, so maybe it would make sense to first also just say why Hennig's ideas don't directly apply, why, why you cannot just uh, do the same analysis as Hennig does. So if you recall this analysis from Hennekes, right, the main idea was to say you leave out this uh, chunk of the data as one, and then in there you're going to see a lot of mistakes. And then the remaining two-thirds are kind of being trained on those mistakes, and so they will rarely make a mistake when, when the first one-third make a mistake. That's the main idea here. Okay. And for his proof, it's, it's really crucial that these one-third of all these hypotheses that there's actually a large subset of the training data that you leave out, like you have this very large held out data set as one, that when none of those T1, T thirds hypotheses, none of them uh, use any of those uh, samples. Okay. And it's also important that the remaining two thirds are, are kind of trained on, on this left out sample. Right? This is very, like a key idea in the proof. But, but this, this fact is just not true for bagging. You don't have a large left out a sample, in particular, not one of a, a linear size. And just to see why, right, if, if you think about it, if you are subsampling k times from a data, if, you, if you're doing linearly sized subsamples k times, then any single sample is only left out with, ex with probability exponentially small in k, right? Because well, for k iterations, there's a constant probability that you're included. So, so which means that if I'm looking at t third subsamples, it's only an exponentially small in t fraction of the data that's being left out. Right? So in particular, like a column like this one, when no one uses it, is really unlikely. Right? So, so you don't have this linearly sized left out sample. So this is the main reason why you cannot kind of reuse Hennig's uh, proof uh, it, to do anything here. Uh, so, so, okay, so what we can ask, you know, can we still try to reuse some of the ideas from Hennig's construction? And, and in fact, uh, we can, and the proof will... Uh, be like a kind of pretty non-trivial detour to a reduction to Hennig's analysis. Okay, so what we're going to do is here. So, so let's uh, just for simplicity of, of this presentation, let's say that bagging, uh, just to keep everything simple, the subsamples consist of exactly half the full data size, and we're doing samples without replacement instead of with replacement. So there's no duplicates, right? So you always get exactly. A, half of all the data. It's just to do a simpler, simpler analysis here. So, okay, so the main idea now in the analysis is to say, okay, let's take this bagging, it's like this random majority vote, and let's try to relate its performance to a deterministic majority vote. So let's kind of, in some sense, get rid of the randomness in the analysis. 
And so for this example here, let's just say that the training data has size six and you're doing random subsets of size three. Okay, so bagging has, is this random, you create these random subsets and do a majority. Now, the one that we're going to compare to this bagging is let's try to look at the majority vote amongst every single subset subsample that I could ever have gotten. Right? So basically there's these six choose three different subsamples that I could have ever obtained. And let's look at these two majority votes uh, and see how do the, the performance of these two compare to each other. Okay. And the claim is that in some sense, bagging, even though we have very few here, is almost as good as this majority of everyone. Right. So that's the main idea in the analysis, which is kind of surprising, right? Because in bagging, you only have log m many subsamples. And over here, you have exponentially in m many subsamples. The claim is that the performance is, is basically the same. And so, of course, right, what, what is it that relates these two to each other, right? How can this be true? And the main observation is that if you think about it, each of these hypotheses that you get in bagging, each of them is basically uniformly randomly chosen from among all the ones that make up the, the deterministic majority of everything, right? Basically, this one, you can find it down here, right? This one is over here, and this one is over here. So if I get a, like, because bagging is choosing random subsets, it's the same as choosing random rows or hypotheses in this deterministic majority of everyone, right? That's the same process. Okay. And now what makes this, this argument work is now to say that uh, this deterministic majority of everyone has large margins. So let me try to, to introduce what margins are. Okay, so margins also date back to uh, like the 90s, and these were introduced to basically explain why Adaboost is also a classic algorithm in, in machine learning, why it works so well. Okay, so, so it's an old result. And so margins in general uh, are used when we talk about voting classifiers, so like majority votes. So let's say if I have a majority vote amongst T hypotheses, then the margin of this uh, voter F on a training point x comma y is just the fraction of correct voters minus the fraction of incorrect voters. That's the margin. Okay. So the intuition is that if you have large positive margins, it means that your majority vote is correct. And in some sense, it's very certain in its prediction, right, that most of these hypotheses agree on what the label is. Uh, if, if the margin is close to zero, it means that you're kind of uncertain about the prediction, right? Maybe half of them say yes, uh, say plus one, and the other half say, say minus one. Uh, so just as a picture here, uh, so let's say we have this data here. Let's say we have a majority of three hypotheses, right? So here are three different hypotheses. Uh, then let's try to look at the, this majority vote of these three and uh, what are the margins in different regions, right? So here I just drawn these different regions where in each region I colored, what would they, like here there are three that say blue, down here there are three that say red, and, and so forth. So if I have a blue point over here, the margin of this point is the fraction of correct voters, that's all three, minus the fraction of incorrect, so that's one. If it's sitting down here, right, two thirds are correct, one third is wrong, so the margin is a third. Over here, one third is correct, two thirds are wrong, so the margin is minus one third. And so that's what the margin is. Okay, so when we have this margin, we can also define what's called, I guess, the, the, the margin loss or the margin error. So, so in general, if I have a majority vote, like the majority vote of everyone, uh, we say that it's margin error with parameter third here is the probability that if I draw a new training point, that the margin is less than a third, right? So... So this is like a stronger requirement. Like, you, like normally you would say that like the normal error is just the probability that the margin is less than zero. But here we're saying, what is the probability that like at least a third is incorrect? So that is the, the margin error here. Okay. So, so the claim is that this majority of everyone, like the majority of all the possible subsamples, you can prove that if you just get, have D over epsilon samples, right? So D over epsilon of the green points up here, if I do this majority of all the possible subsamples, then with high probability over the training data set, uh, the margin is going to be large on almost all the points, right? The chance that I have a, get a new point from the distribution D, the chance that its margin is less than a third is at most epsilon. Okay. So the claim is that we can prove this 
So, so uh, and this, this is enough to show that bagging works if we have this property. So, so let me try to, to show that first. So, okay, so if we look at, uh, let's, let's assume for now that we can argue that if I have DO epsilon samples, then this, this majority of all the possible subsamples is going to have a margin error at most epsilon. Okay, so let's use this uh, to show that bagging is also performing well. So the idea is now to, okay, so let's try to look at some uh, element in the input domain where this majority of everyone has a large margin, right? So the margin is at least a third. So the idea is here, right, since the margin is at least a third, if you look at all these rows here, uh, all the possible subsamples, like at least two thirds of them are correct and at most a third is wrong. Right, so almost like two thirds of them get the label correct on this X. That's the definition of having a large margin. Now, intuitively, if we look at bagging again, right? Bagging, what we're doing is just sampling random hypotheses from the set of everyone, which basically means that you're sampling from, from these either blue or red uh, points. And the observation is, right, that, well, two thirds of them are, have the correct label and only a third has the wrong label. And we're sampling independently and uniformly at random from all of them, right? So just a normal Chernoff bound, since we expect two thirds of these to be correct, we're going to see at least half of them correct with probability one minus exponentially small in T, right? Just, it's just Chernoff bound, right? Basically because we expect almost all of them, like a good constant fraction of them be to be correct, right? So, so, so this is basically the main idea here. Right? If we have a large margin, since bagging is sampling, sampling these independent random subsets, uh, with a really large probability, we're going to uh, have a correct majority in, on that point. So, so the basic idea now is we can say, okay, if I have any distribution D, if I do T of these subsamples, um, then the error of this hypothesis F, what is it going to be, right? Well, intuitively, we can say, well, there's the points in the universe where the margin of the majority of everyone was less than a third. For those, we're not going to guarantee anyone anything, right? So, so we're just going to say, okay, but here we might make a mistake. So this is so F might make a mistake on those points, and for everyone where the where the margin was large, the chance that F is going to make a mistake, the bagging is going to make a mistake, is exponentially small in T, right? So, so basically, if we set T to be around this log M, and M is about D over epsilon then exponentially small in T is, is less than epsilon, right? So, so I'm basically saying that this sampling here is only adding another epsilon to the error, and we already know that G also has an error of at most epsilon, so the full error is at most like two epsilon. Right? So, so this, is, this is basically the proof, right? If we can show that the majority of everyone has large margins on almost all points, uh, on, on also on a, a new uh, random point, Bagging is going to work basically because it has a strong concentration when you sample a logarithmic number of times from uh, from these uh, all the possible hypotheses. Okay, so so the only thing we really have to do is to prove this claim that if I get D over epsilon samples, then this majority of everyone uh, has margin error of at most epsilon. Okay, so the basic idea in that proof is just to to do to reduce it to Hanneke's setup. Uh, and to try and say that, well, this majority of everyone uh, you can somehow do Hanneke's analysis to, to make it work. Okay, so, so this is the basic idea is to try and say, okay, we can somehow turn this into using Hanneke's proof. Um, and, and this is only for the analysis, right? This whole majority of everyone only exists for the purpose of the analysis. Not, it's not part of the algorithm, right? It's only uh, in the analysis. So, so let me just sketch what the idea is. So, so over here, right, Hanneke had this construction of these polynomially many subsamples. Here we have all the possible subsamples. And the main idea is, well, Hanneke's subsample here, you can somehow find them over here in the, in the training data, in, in the, among all the subsamples, right? They exist over here. So, so in some sense, this subset where Hanneke's is, we know that they in isolation behave well, right? You can just you redo Hanneke's proof with a small tweaks. And you can show that the margin error, if I only looked at those uh, rows here, would be very small, would be epsilon. 
Okay, so, so you can somehow say that, okay, at least this part behaves well, right? Now, the last uh, step is to somehow argue that uh, it's not just this one piece here that's equal to Hennig's subsample that, uh, that behaves well. Basically, every single one of all these subsamples in this huge uh, collection of all the possible subsamples, they can somehow be grouped into pieces that look like Hennig's. And, okay, so this is not maybe not so easy to see, but the observation, one observation is that we assume that the training data is just independent samples from this distribution D. So if I permute the data, it's still the same distribution. So somehow I can look at all, I can look at different permutations of the data, and then it still has the same structure as Hennig's. So, so the main idea is just in the, the last bit of the proof, which I don't have time to, to really go into detail with, but the main idea is to show that, okay, I can find Hennig's structure hiding in many places, but maybe there's one copy of Hennig's structure here. If I permute the, these rows here, permute the columns here, this, this is also a copy of Hennig's structure. Maybe this is a copy of Hennig's. And you can kind of just find all these copies of Hennig's uh, careful subsampling hiding amongst all the possible subsamples. And then you can show that, well, in, inside each and every one of these groups, you have large margins almost all the time. And, and so the full thing also has large margins almost all the time. That's the last bit of the proof. Uh, so you just use Hennig's on different subsets. And even to make it work, you, you, you cannot even do disjoint subsets. You have to do overlapping subsets. But, but, the, but that's the main idea is just find, find copies of this careful structure hiding inside all the possible subsamples. So, so this is, the, I guess, the conclusion. And the main result is that bagging is also an optimal uh, pack learner. You need these D or epsilon samples, and you only need this logarithmically many subsamples to get the optimal error. This is an algorithm that's used a lot in practice. And it's like 20 years older than, than Hennig's algorithm. Um, and maybe a side comment here is that uh, in some recent work on boosting, we used Hennig's algorithm uh, to, uh, as a subroutine. And you can also replace Hennig's algorithm there by, by this bagging and get some optimal so-called boosting algorithms. Uh, so, so bagging is really an optimal learning algorithm in this realizable setting. And if you combine bagging with the classic technique of boosting, you'll also get something called an optimal weak to strong learner that, that I don't have time to, to go into now. Good. So, so that's what I wanted to say. I guess that was a full hour almost, but thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to listen. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I guess we have some claps from the chat. Uh, and the viewers can just put some questions. Uh, I will read them aloud. And while we are waiting, I have a question a bit for the proof. So, wouldn't uh, probably the easiest way to, to reduce this to, to Hamaker's proof is basically if you would um, subsample always exactly the same size as Hamaker did, right? Yes, yeah. Because then I, I mean, then I, I think I, I have an easier time basically believing you that you can always permute so like a group and, and get back to Hamaker's. But, like, how do you? How do you go to to like a setting where you sample, for example, half of what Hennigan has sampled? Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Um, the the main idea is to actually say, okay, so like so so there's an O here in the number of samples you need, right? Mm -hmm. and so so the basic idea is to say, okay, I'm gonna use Hennigan's construction on like a thousand fraction of, of the number of samples I get. So basically yeah. in some sense, I'm just going to kind of ignore all but the first 1000 of my points in some sense. And, and then I can, or, or basically I can kind of find Hennig's structure among, uh, what's the right way to say it? Uh, so I have, I have way more left out points than I need and I have way more included points than I need. Yeah, that's the main idea, right? Uh, because if I'm only doing it on like using Hennigus on a thousand fraction of, of the original size, and then I can kind of just zoom in on a place where I have exactly the right number of, of samples. Uh, that, that's the main idea because I have way many more left out and have way many more included. So I can find regions where I have exactly the right number of both left out and, and included things. That's the that's kind of And is that, is that a pencil kind of so done exponential or, or is it only linear? Because that, that uh, sounds now like you're getting an exponential dependency to kind of fit this Hennecke box, right? Uh, oh, so which, the, which one of them gets exponential? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's exponentially many of yeah. these 
uh, Hennig is overlapping subsamples, yeah. But the only thing we really need for the proof is that, well, it, as long as everything is covered by copies of Hennekes, and, yeah. and basically the main idea that makes it work is that every subsample is included in equally many subsamples of Hennekes form, and each of these subsamples have the same size. So that, that kind of so then everything just works out by linearities of expectation. That that's the main I idea, really. That uh, um, yeah, so yeah. so everything will really be included in tons of these subsamples that overlap. Uh, a lot, but but everyone is in equally many, and then you can you can make it work. Uh, still, yeah, is it quite technical? We need the uh, idea to to like reduce over to Hennigan. Right? Yeah, um, we have a question which is like, how important is realizability? Uh, realizability is everything here. I think um, also if you don't have the realizable, uh, which is called agnostic pack learning, typically, then then what you're normally looking for is not something with error close to zero, but you're looking for something that has an error that's at most epsilon more than the best in your hypothesis set. And for that setup, you can actually just do the simple thing. Just look for something that uh, has the best performance on the training data, and this will actually get an optimal sample complexity. So, so if you're not in the realizable case, you don't have to do anything non-trivial, uh, theoretically at least. You can, just, uh, you can just find whatever works best on the training data. And so, so it's only in the realizable case that there was an open problem where, where somehow it helps to do something uh, along these lines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. Um, and oh, there are. Are there any open problems left? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, okay. So, so one thing is to well, I guess one, one open question I thought was natural is. So many of the old results, like where you have the log one or epsilon factor in the same complexity, there you actually have really small constants, like the constant is two or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like the constant in this proof is like a billion or something like this. It's something ridiculous. Also in Hennig's proof, the constant is also like a couple of thousands or something like that. Um, and it seems that these machine learning theorists, like at least the, the one from the older times, seems to actually care about the constant factor. I saw an archive, there was a recent paper that actually gave another algorithm, which is very complicated. It's kind of complicated again, but it actually does get small constants and optimal. Uh, so, but but again, like finding a nice algorithm with small constants, I think that's, that's kind of interesting. And maybe um, it's also not even clear that you need log M samples, right? This is just something that makes the proof work here. Maybe there's a... If you can do with even fewer subsamples, I think it's also an interesting yes. question. Yeah. Would you would you conjecture that the that the constant here of, of just back learning of bagging is uh, would be good? I think so. Yeah, yeah. At least that I think that would be my intuition that it, it should be much better than this uh, billion or whatever. Yeah, that that would be my intuition. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it would even be very very close to. Like a very small constant, like that. That at least would be my intuition. Yeah, maybe it seems I can... like such an intuitive, easy algorithm. So, yeah, yeah. Sure. Maybe I can also add that uh, the, the 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 proof has two parts. Right, there's a reduction from begging to understanding this deterministic majority of all the subsamples, <laughs> and that part of the reduction doesn't lose like basically nothing in the in the constant. Right, so that that part doesn't cost anything. Uh, so if, if one can just give a better analysis of this deterministic majority of everyone, instead of going via Hennekes, that's that's basically what costs a lot in the constant factor. That's going via Hennekes. So can you do it without going via Hennekes? That that would be my guess for how to approach it. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so very much for the, this very clear and nice talk um, and for your time. Um, and then we. Have a launch feature in AirMeet, so after the talk, we can basically uh, sit at a table virtually and uh, talk for a couple of minutes more if you want to socialize. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I'll definitely join. Uh, I have a, a deadline where I have to go, but I can definitely join for a, for a chat for sure. That's, that's yeah. good. Okay.